Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the OERC seminar series. Um, before we get going with today's seminar, I'd just like to announce upcoming seminars. So we have in June, um, Elliot Jones from the Ministry of Education coming to speak with us, uh, and he'll be talking uh, about um, sort of ener the energy transition and retrofitting that's going on in the schools. Uh, uh, particularly timely with government announcing that they're bringing forward the, the replacement of their coal boilers. So that, that should be interesting. Um, so that, look forward to that coming up in June. Um, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I'm very pleased to welcome Dean Spicer um, today. Uh, Dean is the head of uh, sustainable finance at ANZ. And he's going to talk to us about some of the, the challenges and opportunities um, um, for sustainable finance to support the energy transition uh, here in Aotearoa. Uh, so I'd like to hand it over to you, Dean, if you want to share your screen and, and we'll get sure. things underway. And welcome. Right, thank you. Thanks so much. Just one moment, I'm, uh, I'll bring up the presentation and we'll get underway. So look, um, yeah, look, I, I just as I certainly thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the welcome, Sean. Um, uh, I just a bit of a background briefly. I, I headed up uh, capital markets at ANZ, and as the um, sustainable finance um, emerged, New Zealand, it was, it was through the bond markets. So I was lucky to be involved in the early days, and I my passion sort of came from the fact that I I, I liked the idea that uh, finance could be a force for good and um, it certainly has a role to play. Um, so look, I, um, I'm happy to take questions on the way through uh, or at the end, if I'm just talking to the slides, I probably won't take up much more than sort of 30, 40 minutes, um, but as I say, happy either way. So and if I'm use, if i moving too quickly or if I'm using acronyms that aren't familiar with all that, just to sing out. Um, so a couple of things, I want to sort of touch on perhaps some of the themes that we're seeing, some of the global trends, and so my take on, on, on what's driving those. Um, ANZ, uh, sustainability at ANZ and sustainable finance, why it's important to us, what we sort of see our role in, 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 the, um, in the transition. Uh, and what products, I suppose, are available in the market and that, that we are involved with. Um, and uh, touching on transition financing, you know, sort of what, what it is, and why it matters, and a couple of case studies covering some of the products that I'll touch on the way through. Um, so look, in terms of the, the, the trends we're seeing, um, I think there's some mega trends to watch, uh, particularly in the, in the sense that we saw 2021 was a, a record year uh, globally, uh, but also in New Zealand for uh, sustainable debt products. Um, I'd like to suggest that the market's at somewhat of a, a, a tipping point where we're seeing um, growth in green social and sustainable products, financial products. Uh, and I believe that we're gonna see a mainstreaming of these products um, uh, reasonably quickly. And initially it started off with the bond market, as I said, it, it is certainly a part of the, uh, uh, the bank lending market, uh, as well as moving into such areas as uh, sustainable supply chain financing, and um, we've seen the first uh, sustainable linked derivative products in New Zealand this year as well. So look, I think um, what we're seeing is that uh, there is a, um, a link between the access to capital and, and the cost of that capital being tied to companies' ability to show that they um, have a sustainability strategy in place, but also that they are actually delivering against that. Um, so I think this really started off with what I'd call the conscious consumer, and it's moving now to be a conscious investor uh, who is looking at where their money is invested. And so there's naturally pressure going on uh, providers of capital to ensure that they're meeting their, their stakeholder expectations. Um, so we're seeing more standards, more regulation, greater desire for transparency and disclosure requirements. And so in New Zealand, of course, is, is leading uh, the way in some of these areas. 
So uh, you know, uh, climate risk reporting through the TCFD reporting is becoming mandatory, the introduction of the Zero Carbon Act, uh, the Climate Change Commission reports have all been helpful, I think, in terms of uh, focusing attention um, at the highest levels of, of companies. And, and we've seen a sort of an acceleration in, in engagement as a result of that. Um, I think the, there is a shift for good, I believe, in that businesses need to consider their wider stakeholder groups. And so the, the, um, perhaps the, the bigger focus on profits and, and on the uh, providence of the uh, or primacy of, of shareholders, I think it's shifting to, to capture a much uh, broader uh, stakeholder group and a purpose that um, needs to capture both profit and, uh, and, and uh, ESG impact. Oops, I'm going the wrong way now. Um, so look, I think um, this is sort of putting it on a chart. We did see in last year, a uh, record year, as I said, uh, 2022 is uh, still seeing um, significant transactions uh, happening uh, globally, perhaps a little bit of a, a dip in, in, in the first quarter, um, but I would expect we're gonna see another meaningful year of, of, uh, of transactions in 2022. Uh, I suppose the question is, given the uh, the, the urgency um, that climate change uh, presents us with, you know, is enough being done? And um, I, I liken the, this, the question to being, you know, so given the response we saw globally in reaction to COVID, uh, are we going to see the same sort of um, uh, joint fiscal response uh, globally in terms of mobilising our uh, um, uh, attention and, and solutions for, for climate change. Um, and I think that's, that, that's a question that's still to be answered. Um, so certainly uh, plenty of transactions have been done. There's a lot of momentum there, as I said. I, I guess the question in, in everyone's mind is whether uh, this is uh, enough and whether in fact, or fast enough and whether in fact that the financing piece by itself uh, can actually um, deliver what's required. And I think the answer to that is, is probably not. Uh, we're gonna need um, a lot of other uh, innovation other than just the finance increase. Um, and in terms of, um, and I'll touch on this very quickly, but I think that uh, similar to a number of banks, we do see that we have an important role to play in terms of um, assisting clients in that transition and encouraging that transition. So uh, we do have a pledge of uh, to finance or facilitate 50 billion by 2025, uh, we are well on the way to that. Um, we do, uh, you know, aims its purpose, and uh, I mentioned this because I think a number of companies are, are looking more closely at their purpose and how that aligns with their overall sustainability strategy. But ours is to foster a world where people and communities thrive. That's closely aligned, I believe, to, to the whole purpose of what sustainable finance is about. Um, I've touched on sort of three key pillars that we uh, focused on, environmental sustainability, housing, which uh, is key both from an environmental point of view in terms of um, uh, the uh, sustainability of, the, of housing, but also from a social need as well, and financial wellbeing is another key plank. So look, um, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, you know, we, we do have our own key ESG targets in place. In terms of, our, of, of, a, of a team, the sustainable finance team fits very much into the delivery of, um, of the uh, uh, desire to, to, um, to lead in terms of the financing of um, uh, sustainable outcomes. Um, and our, our treasury team as well has implemented and issued uh, green bonds, for example, as part of the uh, overall funding strategy. Um, I, look, I, I won't go, I won't spend a lot of time on this other than just to sort of highlight some of the key uh, ESG uh, areas that we're focused on. Uh, and like any company today, um, you know, this is getting a lot of attention. Naturally, as a, as a lender and a facilitator of financing for a lot of New Zealand businesses, uh, we have to access capital markets ourselves. And what we're finding is when we go to global capital markets that the investors are uh, drilling down um, very closely in terms of uh, what our strategy is and what progress we ourselves are making in terms of um, uh, that strategy. So it, it is a very clear link in terms of uh, that point I made earlier around the access to capital and, and the cost of capital 
um, and the ability to show, show progress. Um, so, but the, the key products, um, I think this slide captures it uh, pretty well. Um, we basically have two types of products that are developed. One is called a use of product, proceeds product. Uh, green bonds, for example, are a good example of that, or green loans. Um, I've got a case study later on, which I'll uh, highlight for them. So, for example, in New Zealand, uh, Mercury has issued a green bond to uh, finance uh, wind farms. And so the key point about a use of proceeds product is that it needs to be an asset that is eligible under the uh, under the global principles. Um, and the, so therefore, you need to have sufficient assets to cover the debt that is issued under that label. Um, so green bonds, uh, the likes of renewable energy is a good example of, of some of the financing you know, purposes we've seen. Uh, Contact Energy is another company that has issued uh, green bonds and has um, a number of um, you know, qualifying assets on its balance sheet. We've also seen green bonds for the likes of New Zealand property companies. Um, so uh, precinct properties, Argosy, uh, Kiwi properties have all, all, all issued green bonds where their, uh, their buildings uh, meet the New Zealand Green Building Council's um, standards and qualify under the global uh, bond principles. On the, in the yellow bit, the uh, social bonds, just to give you a, a bit of an, an example, again, is, is the social bond principles and social loan principles cover off uh, what is um, eligible under this category. Uh, a good example would be um, New Zealand, uh, uh, New Zealand um, social housing provider, Kaiangora, has issued a bonds where they uh, use the proceeds to provide social housing, which falls under the housing category. They're also building those uh, new homes and a pledge to commit to all new homes built will be built to a um, Homestar 6 standard. So the proceeds of their bonds go to both green and social purposes. And so they fall in the sweet spot there in the middle where they're covering both and they, they issue wellbeing bonds as they call them, which are a form of sustainability bond. Um, I think the key point to make would be that not all companies have uh, green assets on their balance sheet. And so the market has evolved for what we call a general corporate purpose product, which is a sustainability linked bond or loan. And so the difference there is that uh, you don't have restriction on what can be funded uh, through the purpose of the for, for, through the proceeds of those loans. Um, however, there are uh, sustainability um, targets, performance targets that are put in place, and the cost of financing is linked to the ability of the company to meet those uh, predetermined uh, pricing outcomes. So, the first uh, sustainable linked loan in New Zealand was uh, for uh, for Sydney Milk. Um, that was uh, a target that was linked to the ESG score by Sustainalytics. We've seen a number of um, transactions done um, in the recent couple of years um, from uh, the likes of um, uh, Katmandu, and just to give you a bit of an idea of how they structured these, these had bespoke targets, which is connected to their supply chain um, uh, and the uh, looking at the uh, sustainability of the supply chain. It also had an emissions reduction target, which is standard for pretty much uh, every uh, sustainable link loan, and um, and tied in their uh, their B Corp rating, so um, uh, that uh, they had to uh, maintain through the course to term of the transaction. So um, we've also seen the first sustainable linked bond in New Zealand. That was a transaction done earlier this year by by Spark. Um, which had a, uh, a target linked to their emissions reduction for scope one and two emissions. So, yeah, two slightly different approaches to um, uh, how these products are structured. Um, and the other transactions I've mentioned, um, or other products I've mentioned that start at a sustainable link derivative is uh, similar to the sustainable link loans where there's a performance target met and the, the swap will uh, price will adjust depending on whether those targets are met or not. Um, similarly, the supply chain financing will have um, a, a target uh, a, that is um, uh, adjust the, um, uh, the payable receivables cost to the delivery of those, of those outcomes. 
Oops, sorry, come on. Um, so look, the, the, there's a number of asset categories that that, uh, that can be uh, included in um, in the um, use of proceeds type products, uh, and a number of them uh, are perhaps uh, reasonably obvious in terms of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and so it is reasonably broad in terms of the, the sectors that can be covered. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on that later, but I think um, you can sort of see uh, that the taxonomies uh, and, um, and bond principles um, do cater for a reasonably broad range of sectors. Um, the, similarly, the stable linked products, um, I've, I've looked at, um, I talked about the fact that there has been two probably main types that have been structured. One with a, um, the NHD score from a third party provider. Um, but more commonly, uh, we're seeing that the um, majority of companies are choosing bespoke targets that are material to their sector and to their company. Um, in every case, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction is is key is a key uh, indicator, performance indicator. Um, to give you some further examples, the likes of uh, Somerset and MetLife Care from the uh, retirement village operators have, have, have both come to market with a sustainable linked loan, and obviously from the same sector, the the, the key sort of um, material issues they were trying to address were their emissions, um, but also. Uh, a big focus was a social aspect around the care of their of their residents, um, and so in both cases, emissions reduction was a target. As, as I said, enough, that's pretty really standard. They, um, they they also chose perhaps a different way of looking at um, uh, the construction aspect, because they are large construction companies building a lot of new villages. Uh, Somerset choosing to target a um, diversion of waste from landfill. As a, as, a, as a target, um, that was a uh, unique uh, target for New Zealand with, not, with very few companies having set uh, waste diversion or construction waste diversion targets across the country. And um, whereas MetLife Care chose to target uh, the, um, the building of, of qualifying green buildings as, as part of the uh, target. And both of them chose to focus on, on resident wellbeing through uh, provision of a build out of um, dementia care facilities and um, uh, so you sort of see that there's some similarities but slight differences uh, between, the, between the companies in terms of how they approach um, their transactions. Um, so there's there's a, a few transactions I've thrown up there. I've mentioned Sinlay and Mercury. Uh, Auckland Council has been um, uh, one of the, was, it, was the first New Zealand uh, borrower to come to the bond market with the green bond and um, has also uh, this year completed a sustainable linked loan and indeed a sustainable linked derivative. Um, so yeah, a, a range of the sectors covered there. Um, and just looking across the different product types, I'm gonna to touch on transition loans and bonds later on. You'll see from the, uh, probably hard to see on screen there, but uh, in terms of the number of transactions, the most common uh, or most popular uh, product has been uh, the green bonds with, uh, with, with social and sustainability uh, uh, bonds uh, becoming more popular in recent times. And certainly sustainable linked loans and supply chain uh, facilitation has also proven uh, popular in recent years as well. Look, just touching on that point of, of transition financing and um, uh, there's, there's some interesting information that's been coming out. I so the Climate Bonds Initiative or CBI they put out information around this and put out a, um, a brochure which is available online and ICMA's got similar guidance as well. Um, so, so the question sort of comes up in terms of you know, what qualifies as, um, as transition financing um, and why is it important? Um, I think the key point is that you know, certainly to meet the Paris um, targets, then there's a need for significant um, uh, financing and uh, of of um, of transition type products. Um, a lot of the entities have quite high emissions, and certainly those in the hardest to bait and the highest emitting uh, borrowers. Um, it's not necessarily clear or hasn't been clear how they can actually uh, access sustainable financing. 
Um, so there was, a, I suppose, a, a need for a, a, a robust industry uh, standard for transition instruments. And that was really around uh, trying to avoid um, any issues of um, questions around greenwashing. Um, so, you know, the, the label is helpful in terms of uh, defining what, what qualifies as a transition and as well as um, uh, covering um, the, um, the, 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 I suppose, the, the process that can be taken by companies considering this, this approach. So the, the, um, the CBL white paper, the, the goal of the paper was to assist in the mobilization of capital flows. Um, it, the paper addresses, you know, um, as I said, how, how we avoid greenwashing when, when, when financing the transition, um, how it affects, uh, how, do, how, how the effects uh, demonstrate that actions are moving the needle and having an impact. And it lays out the transition framework, the five transition principles, as well as um, examples of activities that fall under each transition category, and, uh, and a proposal on, on the use of, of the transition label. So now hopefully that's um, actually readable on screen, but look, what, what, I'm, what, what we're trying to show there is really, um, there's, there's, I suppose only the minority at this stage of economic activities operate today as, as zero or near zero emissions level. And so the, so the vast majority um, are producing emissions that are substantially higher uh, than uh, what's needed um, to uh, transition and rapidly decarbonize. So for, for, for a high emitting activities, um, then um, feasible low and zero emission solutions are available uh, or could be envisaged within a reasonable time frame. The transition should uh, be towards those uh, so those solutions. Um, so I've got up there um, an example of a, of a near zero activity, which would be sort of a, the wind energy as an example. Um, certainly, the um, uh, if you're looking at a, something that has a pathway to a, to a zero activity, then um, that should be um, uh, that, that, that's something that, that can also be, be included. So that can include uh, retrofits um, uh, to, uh, to 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 clean to, to clean fuels, retrofits of um, um, uh, existing infrastructure. Um, and where the activity doesn't align to um, to the global warming itself, um, and there's no pathway to zero activity, you know, that that can also that an example that that would be some long haul um, uh, passenger aviation. So as we're seeing at the moment, though, there is some developments there with talk of um, of sustainable aviation fuels coming uh, in, in in the future, and an interest from most of the airlines to move towards that. Uh, that approach. Um, so the five categories were the near zero, which I've touched on as wind, uh, something that has a pathway to zero. Uh, and then uh, where there's no pathway to zero, uh, that's the third category with um, an interim activity and, and something that has effectively a potentially a stranded activity. So, that, so the framework looks at the, those, those various uh, categories. Um, and um, let's move on to the next slide. So in terms of, in terms of those principles, um, the first principle is that uh, the, all the goals and pathways need to align to, a, to zero carbon by 2050 and the nearing of half of those emissions by 2030. The second principle really touches on the point that all the goals and pathways may, mustn't lead to, must be led by scientific evidence and harmonized across countries. Um, the third point being that offsets uh, don't count, uh, but there should be uh, uh, um, inclusion of upstream scope three emissions. Um, point four was around that the pathways need to include an assessment of the current and expected technologies. And so where there's a viable technology, where a viable technology exists, even if it's more expensive or relatively expensive, it should be used to determine the decarbonisation pathway for that activity. And fifthly, um, it's about that a credible transition is backed by operating metrics 
uh, rather than simply a pledge or a commitment to follow a transition pathway. It's, in other words, it's not a it's, it's not a transition to another transition that it should be um, should be being financed. So, in terms of that distinction between the green label and when that's used, um, then I probably touched on a few examples of when we've had green labels used. It's where there's a long term role to play uh, and to, to a low carbon economy, uh, and there's a um, clear alignment with the carbonisation pathways. Um, the transition label uh, is generally used where there's an ability to make a significant contribu contribution to reducing emissions, but it may not have a long-term role to play. Um, so um, I've got an example later on in terms of um, a transition uh, transaction that's been com completed in the market. Um, and that was around, um, uh, well, in fact, uh, we're seeing it, uh, it could be moving from a from coal to a, a more sustainable um, fuel source, but it may not actually be um, something that is seen as a, um, a as a green as a green asset in itself. Oh, hang on, I just jumping into those case studies. So I'll go. Um, so, so the Mercury one I touched on before, a, a clear green label. Uh, where the funds were used to facilitate and finance uh, the, the building of wind farms. Um, this is a sustainable length loan. So again, I touched on the fact that we had a use of proceeds product being the bond, uh, where the, which was for Mercury, where there was actually green assets that were uh, so supporting the or covering the, the value of those, of those of those bonds. In the case of AGL, it's an example of a of one of the early sustainable and loan transactions where the financing was linked to the reduction in their emissions, but also in the, uh, a shift in their um, uh, to more uh, renewable energy sources. And they were incentivized to, uh, to roll out that uh, pathway um, over the course of the loan. So in a sense, there was a, a transition aspect to uh, the transaction in terms of the outcomes it was incentivizing. Um, but there wasn't actually a, a restriction on what the financing could be used for. So it was actually a sustainable link product, um, but with, with aspects that supported that um, uh, increase in uh, renewable sources of, of energy. Um, the other transaction was one out of Asia, a uh, US dollar bond for Castle Peak Power. It was a transition um, uh, transaction where the um, where the use of the proceeds was actually to construct an offshore uh, LNG receiving terminal in Hong Kong and its associated um, subsea pipeline and gas receiving station. So um, that was to support um, the move from coal sources to, uh, to LPG in, the, in, that, re in that region. Uh, so Castle Point Power um, has actually completed three transactions now uh, under this under this framework. Um, so look, I probably have run through that reasonably quickly, but um, I was going to sort of stop and perhaps see if there's any questions or anything that um, uh, you wanted me to elaborate on. Great, thanks very much, Dean. Uh, certainly a, a lot to think about there. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, feel free to um, sort of raise your hand and you can ask it directly or you can use the chat box and I can, I can read it out. Well, maybe while, while people are thinking, um, I'll just sort of just go back to the the starting point and just a question around the drivers for um, sustainable finance. And um, is, that, is that coming from largely from an opportunities perspective or is it coming from a, a de-risking perspective or is it, uh, how do those two things work together? Yeah, look, I think it's a combination. So, uh, and, and perhaps there's an evolution here because when when I when I first started to see green bonds being issued, I 
thought this is a great thing for New Zealand. I thought New Zealand uh, companies and New Zealand um, investors would be very, very keen on the product. Um, we were, we were, it perhaps took some time to actually get momentum behind um, uh, the market's evolution and um, perhaps some of the early questions we got from, uh, from borrowers was, well, okay, so am I going to get a pricing benefit uh, from this? Um, and the question from perhaps investors was, well, you know, why, why do I need to invest in, in green bonds, for example? Um, you know, I'm not seeing the interest from my investors for this product. So there's a bit of a standoff as to what the why. I think we've moved rapidly from the why to a, a situation of, you know, why wouldn't we do this? And it's partly been driven by the fact that uh, increasingly, um, as I said, I think um, if you look at the recent data put out around KiwiSaver investors, uh, they're actually saying that about over 70% would uh, want to see their money managed if it's been responsible and they'd providers to, 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 to achieve that. Um, so I think there's a, a, from a financing point of view, there's an expectation from, from, uh, from investors that companies will be making this, this move and they're looking for evidence that companies are actually delivering on, on their undertakings. I think there probably has been uh, evidence of a pricing benefit for, for issuers of green bonds. Um, and on the sustainable link product, where there's a, a clear pricing uh, penalty or discount, then, um, then, then clearly that is an incentive. But I don't know that the pricing aspect is, is, is a bigger driver of perhaps what one would anticipate. What I'm finding again and again is companies who have undertaken these transactions um, are finding that stakeholder engagement has been vastly improved and, and particularly that internal engagement. So the, the fact that you need to come together and bring your financing team and your procurement team and your um, sustainability team together and agree on a target and then measure against it seems to be quite a powerful mechanism for driving change. And things that were important but had never really got the, the funding or the support, suddenly if there's a target in place that's been publicly announced and it gets that attention. So yeah, it's, it's proving quite a powerful mechanism for, for getting the focus and the attention that um, is required to, to drive the change. Um, I think as well for, you know, from a New Zealand perspective, um, I think it's a big opportunity. Um, the, you know, there's been comments about the need to show that New Zealand is actually a sustainable, um, has a sustainable brand. To, to maintain market access. And I think that's a really good point because I think um, increasingly the provenance of the products or service that consumers are buying is becoming very much front of mind. The supply chain has been important. And so I think the ability to, to show that the product is uh, produced in a sustainable manner is going to become more and more important. And increasingly the, the data is there to prove that out. And I think so that that provenance of product is going to become a big, a big focal point going forward. Great, thanks. Uh, question from Ian in the chat. Ian, do you want to ask it directly or would you prefer I read it out? I guess I'll ask it. Um, so the New Zealand Super Fund has recently partnered with Copenhagen Offshore Partners to look at developing offshore wind in New Zealand. Do you see a role for your organization in this area? Yeah, look, I think it's a really good question. Um, and certainly I think the New Zealand Super Fund is doing a great job of uh, encouraging and incentivizing and, and showing leadership in the, in the area of um, investing their funds and the targets they put on their portfolio. Um, look, certainly whether it's offshore wind or onshore wind, um, you know, we, we do see a role to play. I mean, that certainly fits within our a 50 billion uh, pledge around sustainable financing. Um, and um, so look, yeah, certainly, uh, and I think ultimately the key point there would be, you know, to actually, for a lot of these projects to get off the ground, then you do need a combination of capital providers. So, so uh, whether that's, uh, you know, you need the equity in there. Um, I think the, the, the amount of debt around that is, is, is willing to support these projects is, is large, but you still need to have a feasible project uh, that is um, you know, that is bankable. So, um, so having having investors like the super fund uh, investing uh, and partnering, I think, is uh, is really helpful. 
Uh, another question from P. McKinley. Do you want to ask that? Or shall I read it out? All right. Uh, support for aviation at this time, especially with the high altitude effects of carbon dioxide equivalents, looks like a case of the emperor's new clothes. This, especially at a time when onshore wind for smaller projects and smart grids is struggling to get development and scaling of funding. So I guess this is a, a question about trade-offs and sort of limited resources and where do you put the money? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and a couple of things, look, I think the, the I, I think that there is a significant capital uh, out there. Um, there are some challenges in terms of, and I think you touched on one of them, that question around uh, getting support for smaller scale projects. I expect that that will, uh, there will be the development of projects that will, will help address that. I think certainly, um, um, you know, an example would be we do currently have a healthy home loan which is you know, uh, focused on on uh, housing that meets the green standard. I think certainly the idea of small scale solar be captured in, in products and funding will be available for those as well. Um, perhaps the market is taking longer to develop than what we'd like. I think that's that's fair. Uh, and it started probably at the, the large end of town fund, funding large companies and perhaps therefore, uh, some of the smaller scale projects haven't necessarily benefited to the same extent. I do think, though, that um, I, I don't know that, that we necessarily are in a situation where uh, there's a lack of funding or support for, for some of these um, opportunities. I think perhaps the bigger challenge might be around just getting some of, if it's an unproven uh, technology, then it's, it's a classic story around you know, who, 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 who takes it through to a commercial stage, uh, how do we prove out uh, or re reduce some of the risk associated with um, you know, a new, new technology, new processes. Um, but certainly the aviation field one, I think, is, is a classic uh, where it does certainly solve a big issue uh, for uh, both for um, uh, the airlines, but also for other companies that are using uh, those supply chains to, to move products and people around. So, um, you know, the, the benefit of actually being able to deliver a solution there would be uh, highly lucrative. And I think um, that there's the technology to do it and there's going to be the financing uh, potentially there as well. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's, there's some gaps in the market in terms of actually the, delivering those projects to a commercial stage. And that's, that's probably where we're sort of seeing some challenges. Great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so I've got another one, uh, and I think it's uh, sort of related to that transition framework. Um, sort of my sense is that sustainable finance is very much forward looking uh, and looking to how things will change in the future. So I have a question about that sort of stranded asset category. And what's, is there a role for sustainable finance in, um, getting assets out of there quicker than they, rather than just forgetting about them and they continue to operate and uh, contribute to problems. Is there a mechanism for finance to um, sort of rescue those stranded assets or decommission them or whatever the term might be? Yeah, look, I, I think there's been, um, so I, you know, I've seen um, a talk of, Exactly that, in fact, where uh, assets can be acquired to be decommissioned, and uh, you know, potentially have funds been talked about, been set up to, to do that. I think perhaps the the challenge I see in this area of stranded assets is that we may not necessarily, um, you know, contemplate um, the asset that's going to become stranded, uh, and certainly, I don't believe that capital markets have necessarily priced in climate change risk to the point where. The value of the asset today is actually recognize, is recognizing those risks. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's a few things when I think about uh, stranded asset risk. Then it's 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 there's an example you've given where you could actually say, well, it's actually feasible and it'd be a good thing to do to actually retire an asset earlier or place it earlier. And and possibly that's that is starting to happen. I think um, if you think about uh, the concept of, of moving a coal boiler to to, to to another to electric, for example, 
the, that asset could have a much longer life if you just wanted to leave it leave it running. But there's starting to be uh, pressures to to drive that change. Uh, certainly, um, you know, a regulatory one is, is is a good example here in New Zealand. So so they're the ones that we can see. But I, the, the, the bit I think is a bit of a puzzle is if we're talking about climate change and sea level rise, then there's probably a lot of other assets that are sitting there that wouldn't have been considered stranded assets ordinarily from the way they're operated, but could become so because of um, you know, the um, the impacts of climate change. So yeah, I, I think there's uh, the, the whole process of climate change, TCFD reporting and and data, uh, the, the need for data I think is is, is an interesting one. I think it's gonna um, rapidly change the way we, we evaluate and um, consider uh, financial risk and return. A comment from, from Birdie around, um, wouldn't aviation as it is at present be considered a stranded asset? Yeah, look, I think you well potentially it could do because there's a couple of things that come to mind there from what I, I've seen. Um, uh, I've seen information suggesting that one of the impacts of climate change could be great high levels of turbulence, in which case you know, uh, that, that could be another reason why, if there's no change, then uh, the way the, the way that the industry works today may not uh, work in the future. Um, but I think that, that, that's 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 the, that's the key point would be. As it operates today, I think that um, there's a recognition that it can't continue to operate today. Um, we're seeing um, coming on stream quite quickly um, uh, some um, uh, approaches that are that would reduce emissions and, and, and for short for short uh, shorter uh, distance aircraft, this talk of electric aircraft being viable uh, quite quickly. So, I think that's where we. As I said before, I think the financing piece can only do so much. I think then we do actually need to see uh, investment in, in, in new technologies uh, that um, to really drives the uh, the change we need to see happen. Uh, and so my hope is that the combination of the two, we need to have the financing better to support it, but we actually do need that innovation to be embraced. Uh, another question related to that: uh, How do we safeguard against Jevron's paradox with any gained efficiencies in fuel type, for example. <clears throat> yeah. Um... Or I guess to, to maybe reframe that in the, the context of how do these um, funds, I guess that would be sort of come under the general corporate purpose kind of bond. How does that get accounted for in the metrics there or is it accounted for in the metrics there? I, I well yeah I I'm not sure I, this is the, the perfect answer. I, I think one of the things that um, I would see in terms of uh, or one of the benefits coming out of the general you know, corporate purpose of sustainable and loan and bonds is that to put those in place you need to have data and you need, and you need to be able to uh, establish a baseline and, and, and have a forward looking um, uh, uh, measurable target that shows that improvement. And for emissions, for example, that needs to be um, you know, a science-based target. So, so typically a, a lot of these targets are, um, uh, are validated by the science-based target initiative. And so there is an alignment to, to um, two and a half degrees of warming uh, through that target. Now, some of the other targets, for example, it was an airline and they were had a target around um, sustaining a, sustainable aviation fuel, then um, again, there would, that would be, for example, it might be around the, the, the fuel mix they use going forward. I, I think, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, though, possibly the concern would be if um, sustainable aviation fuel came on board and actually uh, enabled more travel, in mm -hmm. which case, even though there was more efficient fuel, it led to higher emissions. Exactly. Yeah. That, 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 that is, you know, I, and, and I think um, the answer to that really leads back to uh, that being captured within a uh, company's um, uh, emission uh, measurement. So if absolute emissions need to reduce, uh, then if they are increasing the use of uh, air travel, for example, then that should be captured within their emissions um, uh, reporting. And so to achieve a reduction 
shouldn't that would need to be doing something else to to reduce the overall emissions. Um, so yeah, if, if the data is doing its job, and I think certainly the data is only going to get better, uh, those types of things should all be captured. Good. Got it. Thanks, Dean. And just in case you can't see those, so I think you you got the question there. Uh, any other questions? Well, if that's it, I think we'll we'll leave it there, given that we're rapidly approaching the the end of time. Uh, so I just want to uh, thank you once again, Dean. That was uh, that was really fantastic, um, and certainly gave a, a really good picture of the potential, but also some of the, the real complexities uh, in this area moving forward. Uh, um, so thanks very much. Uh, everyone join, can join me in a, the virtual round of applause. Hey, 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 thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, Dunedin was my, uh, my hometown, so it's always good to uh, connect back to Dunedin. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I wish you all well and um, yeah, certainly um, just say appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Great, thanks very much.